Psalm 51. Title of the message is called True Repentance. Psalm 51. <coughs> For the director of music, Psalm of David. When the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I'll teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from, from blood guilt, O God, the God who saved me, and my tongue will sing your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper and build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you, then bulls will be offered on your altar. Let's pray. Especially messages like that after the first message, I am so drained because it's a massive spiritual battle to do message such as this concerning repentance. Gotta tell you like it is and it's difficult to hear, but something we need to hear if we were to be more like Christ. So please pray that you will soften your heart before the Lord, that only the Lord will speak. And I've never this year, whole year, was I drained as much as today because there was so much spiritual battle in the first service. So please pray to, that God will soften your heart, that He will speak to us concerning the, perhaps one of the most important messages that we can hear concerning true repentance. Let's pray that, pray for me and pray for yourselves. Pray for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ that He will speak to us this day so that our hearts may be turned to Him. Let's pray for a few minutes. Father, we praise you and thank you for your grace and thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you are here with us. Lord, we may scream, we may yell, we may teach perfectly in perfect logic, but unless the Holy Spirit convicts us to teach us this message within our hearts and lives, it's just a mere intellectual play game. We pray that do something no human being can do. Convict our hearts and convict our lives. And help us, help our insight to change. So that our desire may be for you. So that our hearts and lives can be changed. 
There's no way we can understand what true repentance means unless the Holy Spirit convicts us and teaches us. We pray that He will do that within our hearts. And we ask you to speak to us and soften our hearts and open our hearts and help us to be attentive to your word so that our lives may be changed to be that of yours. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think there is such imbalance in today's churches, I believe including ours, imbalance between aspect of God's love, showing the aspect of God's love and grace, and emphasizing repentance. There is imbalance. A lot of churches say that, you know, a lot of people say, maybe our church, like, there's too much repentance and lack of showing of love of God. Well, I think when we look into the scripture, there's drastic imbalance, even within our church, of too much emphasis on love and too less of emphasis on true repentance. I believe, you know, repentance is not that easy. Some of you think repentance is saying, I'm sorry for three minutes and going on with your life. That's a totally secular way of dealing with sin in our lives. When we sin, we think that, and how non-Christians deal with sin is, you know you sin, you did something wrong, and you feel bad, just like some of us. And how non-Christian deals with sin is they go on with their life. Okay, I feel bad. What else can I do? And you go on with your life. And you may even feel bad later too. But you go on with your life. The tragic thing is a lot of Christians do the same. We feel bad about our sins. And we think we repented just because we pray for one minute. It may be a tragic sin. But we pray for one minute. We say we are sorry for a few minutes, even a little longer than that. We even have some tears. We even feel so bad we have tears. Judas cried as well. He never repented. Sad thing, sad thing is, churches in the 20th century, I believe as we look into the scripture, don't know how to repent. We don't know what true repentance is. There is imbalance between not talking enough about true repentance within our church today, including ours. That explains a mess in the society, doesn't it? Because if there's no true repentance, that means next time when you face the same situation and face the same temptation, it is most likely you're going to sin again just as easy. Unless there's radical repentance and change of hearts and change of minds and realize that we have offended God. If there is true repentance, next time you face a situation, you will be able to avoid if we truly know what it means to truly repent as we look into Psalm 51, as we will look look into it today. That explains the mess in a society because there is no repentance. If there is no repentance, it leads to more sin. If there is no repentance, it leads to powerlessness. That explains powerlessness of Christians and churches in today's society. Some, some other countries have 20-30% Christians, yet there is no change in a society. How many percentage of people in the United States in this wonderful country we have in America will say they're born again Christian, yet look at the mess in a society? I believe key and the answer is that we as Christians don't preach repentance and don't know how to truly repent in our lives. That leads to hopelessness because you repented, but you're committing the same sins again. And there is powerlessness for Christians. There's no power among Christians. So what happens? You're hopeless. There's no real power in Christianity. People can't really change that much, which leads to no fear of God. People have no fear of God whatsoever. And we'll do the hideous things that Bible would describe as sin that deserves murder. Sin that deserves to be killed. We would just as easily commit in our lives. Oh, people say, don't feel bad. You know, don't feel too bad about it. Don't preach that sin. Don't, you know, people feel bad enough. Don't, don't talk about that. But as we look into the scripture, sometimes we should feel bad if we sinned. Because there's God-given conscience within our minds and hearts, within us, that should make us feel bad. So that it's a warning sign within our spirit so that we can go to God. And we absolutely need God. 
for repentance. We can repent our sins before God. We need to feel bad at times. Repentance will lead to daily revival. Repentance will lead to reality of salvation. Every day if we would repent, like the true repentance as the scripture describes, every day cross means something to me because I'm cleansed by the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ that would give me renewed strength, rededication of my heart and my love and devotion to Him. In reality, there's no reality of salvation. There's no joy of eternity because every day if we were to repent our sins before God, we'll be renewed within our spirit. Our hearts and minds and from head to toe will be filled with joy, which is merely a glimpse of what is coming in eternity. Why doesn't cross mean much to you? Maybe perhaps because you don't know the Bible. You don't know what kind of hideous sin I am and you are. You don't know how this God, Bible describes God is holy. We don't know what it means that Jesus died on the cross. Oh, you know what it looks like, but you don't know the implication of that theologically as we look into the scripture. Perhaps that's why. Perhaps because you're arrogant. That's why you don't, cross doesn't mean much to you. Cross me doesn't mean much to you because perhaps you don't really think you're that bad of a sinner. If you see, if you say that, cross wouldn't mean much to you because Jesus only died for the sinners. If you really understand that we are filthy sinners before God and all of us, every single one of you and me, all we deserve, Bible says, is to be born naked as a sinner and live a miserable life trying to fulfill ourselves and fulfill our longing and trying to find something to be satisfied, something for satisfaction and be deceived and lied, and live a miserable life, and die naked, and go to hell for eternity. That's all we deserve, according to the Bible. If we realize that, cross would mean something to us. Cross means that I'm saved from all that. That I have a life, every single day of my life, I can get up. In excitement and there's a purpose and motive and someone who loves me, who died for me. And cross would mean something. It will be a motivation for me to live. Motivation for me to die. Maybe perhaps you're arrogant. That's why cross doesn't mean too much to you. Probably cross me doesn't mean much to you because you don't know how to truly repent every day. There can be no face-to-face -face fellowship with the Father without true repentance. As we look into Luke chapter 15, we see the prodigal coming, coming home. After he had squandered his wealth, ran away from the father, did anything, everything possible, and he comes back, and as he repents and turns around and comes back to the father, father runs to the son, and he gives ring and shoes. Ring and shoes of sonship, that is. But best of all, not only ring and shoes of sonship, but best of all, he gives himself to the son. That explains why we repent. We repent because we are sons and daughters of Christ. And he wants us to give us sonship as we turn around and come to him. He wants us to be more like Christ. He wants to be just like his son. He loves us so much. He gives us his sonship. Christ like this. Not only that, but most of all, He gives Himself. Every time we repent, He's giving more of Himself to us. Sometimes we think repentance is something bad. Okay, I feel bad. Okay, I should feel bad or something. But repentance is, is what leads to joy in Christ. What leads to the loving arms of Father. Repentance, very nature and the definition of repentance includes, is included in Father's love. Very re sense of repentance means we receive His love. You see, Great Commission, which is the gospel, includes command to preach and repent. Luke chapter 24, verse 47, it says, Repent and the forgiveness of sin should be preached. Meaning in the very center of meaning of the gospel is included repentance. Mark chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Repentance leads to self-forgetting, fruitfulness, 
Kingdom power, communion with Christ. You see, guilt, when we have guilt, when we sin and when we have guilt, it causes one to be self-conscious. Right? It causes us to be self-centered. And only repentance can give us God-centeredness. As we repent our sins before God, we don't have to be self-conscious. All of our sins and guilt, the penalties, transfer to Christ when we repent. And we can only think about Him and worship Him and live for Him, honor Him, praise Him, glorify Him. That's why we're going to talk about repentance. So we want to talk about 10 processes of true repentance. Why am I? My intention is not to make you feel bad. And that's not my intention. I know it's going to make you feel bad. <laughs> but that's not my intention. Inevitable result of it is you'll feel bad because we are sinners. And we sin. And some of, some of the people that I talk to in our congregation, very congregation that we have, I don't know how many people we have, we have a lot of people in a very congregation that we have. We have some indescribable sins. Many, many people have different kinds of sins. Some of you have sins in your family. Some of you have incredible sexual sins. Some of you have lost virginity and purity. Come and talk to me. Ask for counseling. Some of you have committed abortion. I'm giving this message because I care a lot and God wants me to do it. I don't say it to condemn. I say it so that you can be truly free. And there's no way in this cosmos, in this universe, that you can be free without true repentance. I just want you to, each one of you to be free. Find the joy in Christ. Hey, I give this message with a lot of love and a lot of care. Please learn how to truly repent. We're going to talk about 10 processes that are involved in true repentance. When we look into 2 Samuel, we are in the journey of 2 Samuel when David committed adultery and killed his beloved loyal servant, general. Uriah committed sin with Bathsheba, adultery, murder, covering himself, hypocrisy, all kinds of sins, you name it. Man after God's own heart committed that kind of sins. And when God sends Nathan the prophet, he says, I have sinned against the Lord. It's just one sentence in 2 Samuel chapter 12, but as we look into Psalm 57, it's extensively described what he prayed. But you need to understand, when we look into Psalm 51, it's not just a few minutes of prayer, but it's just symbol of how much he prays in his whole life. And his whole life is that of repentance. Continual uh, process of growing closer to the Lord through his life. And we need to understand that. So repentance is not just saying one minute in your prayer, I'm sorry. It's a lot deeper than that. If we truly understand this, I believe it will transform the churches, transform your families, and transform the society. And this world will never be the same again with those people who are cleansed before God, who are power-filled. Power of the gospel will truly remain in your heart, minds, and souls. That it will inevitably transform others because you are truly free. We are not talk about that. It is not that easy. There is, there is true freedom in Christ, but it is not as easy as we, we want, want it to say. Instantaneous society. You want instantaneous freedom. It just doesn't happen. Not because God is some kind of God that does not want to forgive you, but because we are that sinful. We are that hard. In order for us to realize His mercy and grace and our sinfulness, it takes time. And we'll talk about that later. Repentance is not that easy. So we'll talk about 10 process of true repentance. And I pray that I'll, we just, I, I was, I almost wanted to do this in five weeks. <laughs> but just can't do that. We gotta finish second Samuel this semester. I don't know if we can or not, but we'll try. So I have to do this in one week. And it's a lot of stuff, but take notes. If you can't take notes, get the tapes and then go home and take notes and try to follow True process of repentance. And as you continue to listen and try to apply, may the Holy Spirit grant you repentance. 
you'll be able to repent and you'll, you'll have powerful Christian life. Please don't just listen and forget about it. Like you watched another TV show. If you understand true meaning of repentance, your life will never be the same again. Let's start this journey together, shall we? Ten process of true repentance. Number one. When we think about first aspect of his repentance, it was a plea for God's mercy. Plea, his repentance in Psalm 51, was a, first of all, plea for God's mercy. God's mercy has to be the basis of repentance. That's why repentance is something good. Because we go to the very nature of God who's loving and accepting. And we go and He loves us. He receives us. He gives us His mercy. Verse 1, He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing, never failing love. Always He sees us with love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. It's a Repentance is very plea for God's mercy. That's why there's always hope when we sin. Because we can go to God. Satan, what exactly Satan doesn't want you to do is he doesn't want you to repent. He'll say, no way God's going to forgive you this sin. What are you going to believe? What Satan says to your minds or what the Bible says? Unfailing love of God is there before us. We have hope. He promised to forgive. And He does what He says and He keeps His promises. But when we think about God's mercy, we can think of ourselves like we are attorney. Like we deserve it or something like that and say, Lord, look at, the, look at this. I deserve your mercy. No, we are not the lawyers or attorney. We are like good picture of repentance. We are like beggars. We beg for the mercy of God. Lord, I'm gonna die with, if you don't, if you don't give me what I need. If you don't give me a little bit of your mercy, I'm gonna die. See, point about that is that God does not have to give us His mercy. He can easily say, and just rightly so, no way you filthy rag, get out of here. He can easily say that, but He doesn't. It's not because of our repentance He forgives us. But when he sees our repentance, something about it, he becomes gracious, God. And he graciously gives his mercy and forgives us. So we don't deserve God's mercy. We don't deserve forgiveness. It's just that when we do, he sees that and he becomes merciful. And he allows us, grants us repentance and he forgives us. So it's a plea for God's mercy. We don't deserve it, but he is Amazing, merciful, loving God. And it's a plea to that when we repent our sins before Him. If you want to repent, first point has to be down in your heart, down in your mind, down in your soul, that He will always forgive you. It's that we are the problem. He's not the problem. We are the problem. It's that we are, our hearts are hard. We are the problem. Number two, second process of true repentance says, it's acknowledging and confessing my sins. My sins. is not someone else's sin. It's not because of my brother was smarter than me. It's not because my mother changed diaper in a wrong way. It's not because my parents sinned and my parents treated me this way. It's not because I was molested. It's not because of anybody else. It is my sin. No blame. Okay? Me. Look at verse, verse 1. Acknowledging com and confessing my sins. My, me. I am the problem. I am the sinner. Not because of society. Like the sociologist says. Not because of psychology or, you know, the, someone else. Like the psychologist says. But I am the problem. My sins. I have sinned before the Lord. Just like verse 1, it says, Have mercy on me. How many first-person person pronouns mentioned in two verses? Five. It says, Oh, have mercy on me, O oh God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Proud of my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sins. It is my sins that I sin before God. 
When you say it's my sin, we're talking about specifically. You need to repent specifically for all your sins. Because verse 2 says, wash away all my iniquity. Every single one of them. As much as our minds allow, we need to repent our sins. You see? We need to say we're sorry. And as long as we can, as much as we can remember. And if you can't remember, ask God, God help me to recall some of the sins. If you can't remember that, you need to pray, Lord, even the things I can't remember, forgive me. Repent for that as well. You see, some of you might think that verse 2 says, all my sins, all, all I have to pray is that, Lord, forgive all my sins, amen. But you see, see, Psalm 51, you need to understand, is a poetry. First two verses, ask for plea, last two verses, end with the uh, same thing, as well in between, there's five lines, three lines, three lines, five lines, it's a, it's a poetry. A okay, very perfect poetry and a song that David writes. Meaning, this is not the only prayer that he offered. It's just the symbol of what he prayed. It's just symbol of how he prayed all his life and just glimpse of the content of what he prayed. He spent much time in his life in repentance. And all of his life, forgiveness, forgiveness, he's trying to receive the forgiveness of God. And it was a recovery, healing time. All of his life as he confesses his sins before God. And you need to understand it's, it's a lifetime thing. And we, we need to, as we think about acknowledging and confessing our sins, all of my sins, we need to meditate and as much as we can confess our sins before the Lord as specifically as possible. It is my problem and as specific, as many as you can, you need to repent your sins, even the sin, even the sins that you cannot even remember as much as you can. Number three, third, process of true repentance. Not only plead for God's mercy, not only acknowledging and confessing my sin, but we need to confess my sins are against God. So emphasis is that it's against God. We need to confess my sins are against God in the primary sense. It's against God in the primary sense. Where do we see that? Verse 4. It says, against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Against you, you only. He's not saying he did not commit sin against Bathsheba. He did not com commit sin against Uriah as he killed him. Of course he did. He understands that. But primary sense, it was a violation against God's law. God's law says, do not commit adultery. Do not mur murder. It was a offense against God's law. When he committed sin against Bathsheba and Uriah and so many other people, it was his, his sin against his people. God's people who was made in God's image. In each one of them, implanted in them is the image of God. He offended them. Not only did he sin against people, but primary sense, he offended God. Because he offended people who are made in his own image. It was a very offense against his character. When you disobey God's law, it's a disobedience to, against God's character, rebellion against His character. So whenever we sin, primarily all the sins are against God. When we sin, repentance is not a regret. Okay? Regret means, I got caught. Again, their emphasis is yourself. It's not remorse. Remorse says, because a lot of you feel remorse, you've well, the remorse says, I feel bad. So a lot of you feel bad. Right? But that's not repentance. But repentance is God-centered. Knowing that you have offended God. You see, think about David, you know. Before he repents his sins, he was very self-centered. He was self-protected. In fact, the reason why he killed Uriah and aborted him was because of the fact that he wanted to save his face. Bathsheba became pregnant, so he wanted to cover that. He tried that. He tried to make uh, Uriah sleep with Bathsheba. He wouldn't. So how? what else can he do? He had to kill him so that he can get Bathsheba as his wife. It was a self-protective procedure to cover himself. But we realize in, at this moment, as he truly repents, he becomes selfless. And he realized he sinned against God, how drastically he's different. Not trying to cover himself, but he's depending on God to cover his sins. Only Christ and His blood can cover our sins. Fourth, process of repentance is 
Not only is it plea for God's mercy, acknowledge confessing my sins and is against God, but also repentance for sinful nature. So sinful nature, emphasis there is sinful nature. David's repentance was plea for cleansing of his very own sinful nature. Repentance for sinful nature. Look at verse, <coughs> verse 5. It says, surely I was sinful at birth when he was born. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. What is he saying? He's not, he's not blaming his sinful nature as if he's saying, Lord, I sinned and I had to sin because I was born as a sinner. What can a sinner do? He sins. So because I was born as a sinner, Lord, I could not help but to sin. Everybody else does it. Everybody else sins. Everybody's born as a sinner. No, he's not giving excuse and he's not talking about that to blame his sinful nature, but rather he's talking about the depth of his sin. He's saying sorry for his behavior, but he's also saying, Lord, you know why I'm sinning? I'm sinning because in the very depth of my coreness of my being, I'm a sinner. I was born as a sinner. I'm that bad, Lord. He's repenting for his sinful nature. He's not blaming anyone. He's not even blaming his mother when we say in verse 5, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. He's not blaming his mother, but he's talking about the death of his own sins. And repentance should include that. When you say you're sorry, you know, go a little deeper and repent for your very sinful nature. Number five, fifth process of true repentance is prayer for inner transformation. It included prayer for inner transformation. Verse 6, verse 10, verse 12b talks about that. Verse 6, verse 10, verse 12b. Look at this, please. Verse 6, it says, Surely you desire truth in the inner parts, and teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Talking about inner transformation. He's asking for inner transformation, knowing that he is sinful in his core of his being sinful nature he's saying lord transform me change me because and teach me truth and wisdom verse 10 it says create in me that's why he's saying create in me a pure heart heart that is pure O oh god and renew a steadfast spirit within me what is he saying people people of god beloved look at me please for one minute I know a lot of you are struggling with your behaviors, whether it's bad behavior, habits, whatever it is, all kinds of things, eating habits, masturbation, whatever you're talking about. A lot of people talk to me about everything. And you're trying to change your behavior. And that's, that's not a bad thing. But that's not the answer to change. It's not, it's not the answer to change your behavior. See, what has to change is your inside. You see, why do you do something outside? Because inside, you're filled with filthy things. You're filled with desires. You're filled with passion for these behaviors. And you only act out because your inside is filled with uh, things that, that shouldn't be filled. Even if you don't have to watch a movie, if you already have a movie in your mind, you're going to sin. You already have that bent tendency and desire. And what has to happen is transformation of inside. Okay? That's what he's saying. Create in me a pure heart. If you want inside to change, there's no way you can be transformed without the scripture and prayer. Unless the word of God goes into your mind. All the time in your life it's filled with garbage. Unless the spirit of God convicts you through the truth and through the prayer changes your desire. You will continue to do things outside. I know a lot of you struggle out with outside behaviors. That's why it says when you look into verse 6, you desire truth. Think about the truth. And then you teach me wisdom. If the truth goes into our minds and the Spirit of God uses that truth to help us to apply in our lives, that's wisdom. You know the truth and how to apply that in, in my life and in which way? Wisdom will do that. Truth and wisdom. As the Spirit of God uses truth, uh, truth giving us wisdom, we can apply that in our lives and our behavior can change when there's internal transformation. And a lot of you, 
There might be two kinds of people concerning those behaviors. One, one kind of person is, you are apathetic. You are hopeless about your behavior now, and you quit trying. Maybe some of you need some slap in your behind or on the face or something, so that you realize you got to try again. You got to keep going. Some kind of tragic circumstances and sufferings will come to you if you are not trying to get rid of the behavior by continually changing your inside in most being. But I think there are a lot of you that I know who are trying your best to change your behavior. Okay? And that's a good thing. And you're, you're trying. For those of you, I want to encourage you. You know why? God knows that your inside is still filled with filth, bad desires, filth in your mind. God knows that. So what does He want you to do? He wants you to continue to work, continue to cleanse, and thereby changing your behavior, by changing your inside. He knows you're going to fail because already for 20 years or so, you, you filled your mind and filled your heart with garbage and that became your desire and passion and habit. But slowly but surely, as your inside will change, your behaviors will change. I think about my life. You know, the things I used to struggle with, I don't struggle with it. I struggle with other things. I don't struggle anymore with the things I used to struggle with. I think to myself, what in the world changed me? I don't know. You know why? Because somewhere in there, as I love to study the Bible, as I just study to pray, through the some years of time, decade or two, my inside changed. Things I love to do, I don't love to do anymore. I hate it. Things I hated to do, some good things, and now I love to do. When my inside changed, outside inevitably changed. Why do you sin? Because you love to sin. And you love it and you cannot help but to. You, if you really don't like it, you have choice to. Don't give me that garbage saying, I can't help. Don't give me that. You have a choice. Every time you sin, God made you like that. But you sin because you really love it. It's in your heart. You desire it. But you see, when your insides start to change, truth goes into your heart. God gives you wisdom. Your desires change. Then you're not going to do it anymore. You're not going to like it. You're not going to desire it. Inside has to change. That's what you have to pray. So guys who are trying, keep going. God knows you're going to fail because your heart and mind is still filled with garbage. But keep on planting the Word of God. Keep on praying that Word of God will become double-edged sword to, to do some surgery in your heart to change your desires. Amen? Six. Process of repentance. As you plead for God's mercy, acknowledge and confession of sins, my sins against God, sinful nature, and praying for inner transformation, sixth, is plea in the cross. Plea in the cross. Not a single thing we can do about that sin that so reside within us. Verse 7 and 9 talks about plea in the cross. Half the time you should be thinking about my sin. I have offended God. The other half the time you need to think about the power of the cross. The meaning of the cross. Depth of his death for me. When you look into verse 7, it says, Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. What is hyssop? It's something that was dipped into water. So that when the priest would see lepers who had been cleansed, who had been healed, would come. And he would, the priest would declare that you're clean now. Your sins are cleansed and you're clean now. And dip, would dip hyssop into water and sprinkle the water. Saying you are clean. Symbol of blood of Jesus Christ. As God dips hyssop, to his son's blood, he sprinkles it to us, saying, you are clean to the spiritual lepers. Disease that so fills us, that makes us unclean. Spiritual lepers we are. We are clean. 
Another image that we see in verse 7 is, it says, wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. It's talking about the fact that sinners are like filthy rags. Unclean. But most powerful detergent, the blood of Jesus Christ, would wash that filthy rag, would become, that rag would become precious rag that is white as snow. Garment. That's what we are. Spiritual lepers, now we are clean. By His blood. We are filthy rags. But now we can become garment of Christ. Jesus wears us every day. He lives in this world. And when people see us, people see Jesus. When people touch me, they touch Jesus. Plea in the cross. Seventh. Seventh process of repentance is plea for the restoration of joy. Plea for the restoration of joy. Verse 8 and verse 12 talk, 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 talks about that. Verse 8, it says, let me, hear the, let me hear joy and gladness. Verse 12, it says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Some people think that when you sin, you lose your salvation. Some people think that. That's not what the Bible says. Once you become believer, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot lose salvation. If you truly are saved, to know whether you are truly saved or not is difficult to know. Unless you, you really look into 1 John and see the evidence of salvation through your life. Look at the evidence of salvation in 1 John. Are you truly saved? It's a lot less people are saved than we think. But if you truly are saved, you cannot lose salvation. That's why when you look into verse 12, David knows he did not lose his salvation. That's why he's saying, restore to me salvation? No. He says, restore to me the joy of salvation. You can lose the joy of salvation, but you cannot lose salvation when you sin. So he's pleading for the restoration of joy. I want each and every one. Why am I giving this? I want each and every one of you to experience the joy of salvation. Every single day of your life. My, I want each one of you to experience that. I experienced that. Do you know what it means to stand free in Christ? Clear conscience before God and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm a sinner before God, but I'm free in Christ. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm a sinner before God. I have weaknesses. I get angry and mad. Yes, there are things I struggle with, but I'm free in Christ. I'm becoming better every day for the Lord. I feel the joy of Christ. Every day. I want each and every one of you to experience that. Why in the world am I here in this campus? I want each and every single one of you to experience the joy of your salvation. Not a single thing you have to worry about. And the worst thing that can happen to you is you die and go to heaven and be with Jesus. <laughs> what a life! David is pleading for that. You see, when you sin before God, that connection with God is broken. And you cannot experience the joy that the world cannot understand. You are joyless Christian because you are not truly connected to God if you are joyless. If you truly are joyful, you know only source is God. Only source is through the blood of Jesus Christ, cleansing power of the cross. Something wrong if Christian does not have a joy. I'm not saying Christian is without suffering. In the midst of suffering, in the midst of difficulty, there's indescribable, illogical joy. Only can come from Jesus. Hallelujah.
Eighth, process of, of repentance is plea for his presence and continued servanthood. Plea for his presence and continued servanthood, meaning he is continually asking for his presence and asking God to continually use him. Lord, may I be in your presence and continue to use me. That's what he's praying in verse 11 and 12. Let me explain that, those two verses. Verse 11 and 12, he says, Do not cast me from your presence and take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me willing spirit to sustain me. So when he says, do not cast me from your presence, he's, he's asking for his presence. Let me, let me live within the range of your eyes. Let me be in your presence. Let me stay in your house. Let me worship you, honor you, praise you. Let me live under your wings. But as he prays that, he says this, take your, do not cast me from your presence, verse 11, or take your Holy Spirit from me. What does it mean, he says, when he's asking for, don't take Holy Spirit away from me. Some people think that, see, that means you can lose salvation. Because only believers have Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit leaves them, that means you can lose salvation. But you have to understand what it means. You see, only in two places in the Bible, it says Holy Spirit left the person. One is in case of Saul, when he disobeyed God, it says Holy Spirit left him. Another place is here. Right here it says, don't, as if it's possible, David cries out, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. What does that mean? In terms of, see, Holy Spirit can have different kinds of functions. Holy Spirit has many functions. Let's, let's just talk about two functions today. One is, when the to a, a unbeliever, someone who does not have salvation, and he, for the first time, trusts in Jesus alone for salvation, so Holy Spirit comes and regenerates him. He was dead in his spiritual life. Now he is alive within spirit. There's joy. There's connection with God. He can experience joy in Christ. He can experience a love for God and love to praise God and worship God and study the Bible, love for other people, inescapable, indescribable joy is there. He becomes a believer. He's alive. When that happens, there's nothing that can separate him from the love of Jesus Christ, meaning Holy Spirit will always be there and cannot depart from him in terms of Holy Spirit's function of regeneration. But there's another function of Holy Spirit. It's called Holy Spirit uh, function of empowerment. 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 Holy Spirit can do a lot of things. Holy Spirit's empowerment can happen to not only believers, but non-believers and even animals. For example, when you look into Balaam's donkey in the Old Testament, how in the world did Balaam's donkey talk? Holy Spirit came upon him and empowered that donkey to speak. That's empowerment. Just like when you look into the scripture in the life of Saul, I believe Saul was not a believer. He never trusted God and coming Messiah. But what happens? It says Holy Spirit came upon him. I believe it's empowerment. Because he, he was to be a first king of Israel and that empowerment has to be there. Anointing has to be there as a king so that he can be a king over Israel. So when he says when the Holy Spirit left him, it means that empowerment, that anointing left him so he could not be a king anymore. So after that he becomes a terrible king. So when David is praying as a second king of Israel, he's saying, Lord, don't take Holy Spirit away from me. What he's saying is don't take that empowerment away from me so that I will still be a king. Do you know what he's asking? He's saying, Lord, continue to use me as your servant, as a king over Israel. Whenever somebody sins, that's the first thing he asks, if he tasted the work of God, doesn't he? Lord, will you still use me? Because it's such joy to be used by God. And when one sins before God, he will say, Lord, are you still going to use me? I don't care if you kill me, but continue to use me. Perhaps that's how Peter felt when he failed and denied Jesus. Peter denied Jesus three times, and after Jesus resurrected in that night, that when they're sitting together in that fire, around the fire, when they're cooking fish, Jesus is asking Peter, Peter, Simon Peter, do you love me? He has three times to forgive him. Peter's thinking, will he still use me? Am I still an apostle? Am I still a disciple? I mean, I deny Jesus. 
my beloved friend and lover of my soul and my savior. I denied him. Will he still use me? Jesus says, Simon Peter, do you love me? Yes, you know that I love you. As he forgives, he says, feed my lamb. What is he saying? I'm still going to use you, Peter. You failed, but I forgive you, and I'm still going to use you. David is saying, Lord, continue to use me. You know, that's how I feel so many times. I'm so thankful that I'm serving the Lord. My. I feel like, and I sincerely feel like it. I feel like I'd rather die than to be, not to be used by God. Somehow I want to be used by God. I want to clean up garbage for the Lord. I don't care what I do. I just want to be used by God. And I think that's what David is asking after he sinned. Lord, don't let Holy Spirit depart from me. Anoint me continually and use me as your servant. Ninth, process of self, uh, repentance. So basically up to <coughs> eighth process where David is asking for something. And ninth process, is, which is included in the repentance. If you truly repent, ninth process will come for the first time, he's giving something to the Lord. And it has to be included in, in the repentance process. True repentance. If it's a true repentance. If you truly repent, you will commit your life for him. That's the ninth process. Committing himself. Commitment to live for him. Commitment to live for him. And that has to be. Has to be. May I gently remind you. Has to be included in the true repentance process. Commitment to live for him. Verse 13, he's making a commitment to his ministry. Verse 14, he's com making a commitment to sing. Verse 15, he's making a commitment to declare his praise. Look at verse 13, 14, 15, and 16. He says, verse 13, Lord, if you do that, if you save me, if you wash me, if you forgive my iniquity and transgressions, if you truly change my heart internally, if you will be in my presence and not take not thy Holy Spirit away from me so that you will continue to hear me. If you do that, if you restore the joy of your salvation, Lord, I will. Verse 13, teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, O God, O save me. And my tongue will sing your praises and righteousness. And Lord, I will open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. He's making a commitment of himself. To the Lord. And look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. What is he saying? You do not delight in sacrifice. That word sacrifice is not talking about act of sacrifice, but animals. You do not delight in animals you give, animals I give. He's saying, you do not delight in sacrifice. Or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offering things you give those animals. What is, what, is, what is David saying? David is saying, you do, not del you do not desire what I can give, my material or religious services or religious acts. But verse 17, he says, you desire the sacrifices of God. Sacrifices of God are broken spirit and broken and contrite heart. You know what? You know what David is saying? David is saying, Lord, you do not desire what I can give. Not even my time, not even my talent, not even my, my money. You do not desire that. But what you truly desire, more than all the things I can give, is myself. My heart. My very own self. You desire a broken and contrite heart. Heart that desires to worship Him. Heart that desires to obey Him. Gives Himself to the Lord. And say, anything you tell me, I'll do. Anything you want me to do, I'll do. Anything you want me to be, I'll be. Anything you want me to eat, I'll eat. Anywhere you want me to go, I'll go. I'm a broken and contrite spirit. God does not desire animals to be on that altar. God desires you to be on that altar of the cross. True repentance will commit yourself to lead, live for Him and Him alone 
And there is a goal of repentance. Okay? Goal of repentance. Goal of repentance superficially. There is superficial goal and deeper goal. Superficially, it's getting rid of specific deeds, as I just talked about. Oh, I'm sorry for this behavior, that behavior. I'm not going to swear anymore. Of course, that is important too, and we need to get rid of that. But that's the superficial meaning of repentance or goal of repentance, to get rid of behavior. But true, deeper goal of behavior is lordship of Jesus Christ. Completely love Him and live for Him, giving ourselves to Him. And when we do that, our behaviors will certainly change. To have a broken and contrite heart, that is a goal of repentance. To have goal, to utterly, totally give ourselves to the Lord. Put ourselves as we deny ourselves and carry the cross and follow Him. That is goal of repentance. When you repent, you don't, that does, is, is not generated. Your life is not changed. You are not more committed to Him. You don't have a passion for Him. Something wrong with your repentance. That is not true repentance. You pray for five minutes, I'm sorry, and you go back to the same thing. That is not a true repentance. If you truly repent, your life will change and your life will never, ever be the same again. You may sin again, but increasingly you are becoming more like Christ. There's drastic difference through a period of time. Because your internal will change, inside will change. And your behavior will change. And you'll be more like Christ. you become cleaner God, man of Christ. And He weighs you every day. And people will touch you and see you. And people will touch Christ and see Christ. No difference in life. It's not a true repentance. Tenth. Last but not least, process of repentance. Now, again, up to ninth thing was concerning himself. But this time, he pleads. For everyone, the people of God, nation, and the church. He pleads for everyone. He prays for everyone. Please look at me for one minute. Get this in your heart and mind. Sin always, always affects other people, your family, your church, yourself, the nation, your Bible study, everything. Just think of it like this. When you have a sexual sin with somebody, it's sin against yourself, sin against that person, sin against your spouse in the future, and that person's spouse in the future, their parents, your parents, and the generations to come. Your generation and their generation. There's an inseparable union, biologically, emotionally, spiritually, has taken place. Inseparable union. Some part of him is in you. Some part of you are in him. And that's carried on through generation. You sin before God. Sin always affects others. So David, please, after he repents concerning himself, dedicating himself, he pleads for his nation. Especially because he was a leader. It affects the whole nation. When a leader of a nation, politically, spiritually, sin, the whole, everybody suffers. And he prays for the nation. We need to do that. You, as you repent your sins, not only... Say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my family. I'm sorry for my future spouse. I'm sorry for my future children. They'll have scars in them because I have scars in me. And you pray for the church. You pray for the nation. You pray for the world. Within the whole body of Christ, you made a scar in Christ's body through yourself. Not to condemn you, but to teach you what it means to truly repent. That's 10 clarification, uh, 10 uh, process of repentance. Let me just, I know time, a lot of time has gone by, but let me just give three clarifications because I know a lot of you will try to apply this process of repentance. 
and I appreciate that, that you're trying to apply. But let me make some three clarifications so that you understand more of what it means to truly repent. Number one is that true repentance is key to the revival. Revival will come only if there's true repentance. Zechariah 12, 10. Can we, can we turn to that? We just have to look at this. I'm so excited about these verses. I, if you're just writing notes, just write it. I'll just read it to you. Zechariah 12, verse 10. It says, And I will pour out the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. He's talking about how can a spirit of grace and supplication come? How can the time of revival come? It says, they will took on me and one day they'll have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. And grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Basically, we'll talk about revival will come when there's repentance. Can we turn a few more pages to the right? Malachi chapter 4. Last verse when it talks about messianic age. Amazing time of revival comes. It says in verse 6, when the Lord comes, He will turn. Very meaning of repentance means turning, changing of mind, changing of heart, changing of inside. It says He will turn. He will change hearts of the Father. So when Father starts to repent, and when children start to repent, there will be revival within themselves and the family and the nation and the churches and the world. What causes that? That turning of hearts. Repentance. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to, the child, to their children and hearts of the children to their fathers. He's talking about time of revival will come. Second clarification. So it's that important. Second clarification is this. You must have, as you repent, you must have time of mourning. I'm not talking about mourning, 8 a.m., 9 a.m., mourning. Mourning. Uh, mourning. Weeping. Crying, mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, mourning. Okay. We see that amply throughout. So whenever we see genuine repentance, we see time of mourning. Look at, let's just look at one passage. James chapter 4, please. Important text. If you look at James chapter 4. Again, James chapter 4 emphasizes the superficial sins of you know, hating somebody, jealousy, and gossiping, quarrels. These are all superficial things. And the major sin is mentioned in verse 4 when it says, You adulterers, in our hearts we love other things. That's what we sin. We don't love God. We don't, we don't have Him as our Lord. We haven't put ourselves on that altar of the cross. That's what we sin. And it talks about depth of sin. And as it talks about that, look at verse 8. It talks about repentance. James chapter 4, it says, Come near to God and He will come near to you. Wash your hands as it talks about process of repentance. You sinners and purify your hearts. You double-minded. And then it says, grieve, verse 9, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter. Take that grin off of your face. That's what he's saying. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and then He will lift you. See, you gotta have time of that kind of time of mourning. Okay? In true repentance. It's not one minute you say, I'm sorry, okay. As if you turned off the commercial or something. You know the television shows when, when you see when you see a murder in the news and then you go, next, sports, bulls lost, or something like that. You just cannot have that kind of attitude in repentance. It should affect us. It takes time for it to affect us. To understand, dude, that's why we need to meditate, have some long period of time. If you especially committed some major sins, depth of sin against God, you have to meditate. As you look into the scripture and understand and ask God. You see, repentance is our part. We are repenting. But, again, it's a mercy, plea for mercy. So it is major part is Him granting us Editor of Repentance, 2 Timothy 2.25 talks about that. Acts 11.18 talks about that. God has to grant us repentance. To understand the depth of the sin against God is what, what has to happen in that half the time of mourning. But the other half of time, as you mourn how you sinned against God, you got to meditate on the power of the cross. Amazing power of the cross to understand that, to make that deep, get that deep in your heart. 
It takes time. Holy Spirit has to help us. And within the time as you meditate and pray that God will grant you repentance, within that time, somewhere, somehow, Holy Spirit helps us. And it takes time. Within the time, you can fast. Perhaps you want to fast 12 to 12, 12 p.m. to 12 afternoon or something and skip a meal or two or something for some period of time and you want to reflect on that and then in that meal time you pray and meditate and think and repent. Meditate on how you offended God and the power of the cross for a certain period of time. At that, in that time, you cannot do anything. Service. You can have quiet time, you can go to small groups, you can go to Bible studies, but not serving something, you are re- restraining yourself from that, controlling yourself from that within the time. In the Old Testament scripture, many times they would put ashes them, over themselves, meaning they would not eat, they would not do anything. They would just reflect on that and clear themselves, then they can do ministry. So a lot of times you cannot even do any service or ministry in the time of repentance. You know, Good Friday and Easter is coming within a few months. Maybe some of you who committed some major sins. And you know you have to deal with that. You know you didn't deal with that right. Maybe for a few months you would like to do that. So that the time of Good Friday and Easter service can be time of freedom. Times of refreshing. You need a time of mourning. Weeping. Meditating. Reflecting, understanding, realizing, receiving time. Third clarification. Last but not least, I'll just briefly mention because next sermon I preach, that is after retreat, probably second week of February, I'll preach on this. Third principle, I, I'll expand on this. Third principle, third clarification is this. Forgiveness is a scary thing. It sends me shiver down my spine. When I think about this in life of David, and we'll talk about the life of David. Forgiveness, third point is, forgiveness does not nullify the consequences of sin. Forgiveness does not nullify the consequences of sin. When you look into 2 Samuel chapter 12, when David says, I sinned, God through Nathan says, I forgive you. But after that, he still talks about consequences and David has to go through the indescribable, scary consequences in his life. Next time you sin, you think about that. God is a holy God. And the Bible says we should fear him and we don't have enough of that in 20th century churches. Only way sinful, apathetic humans will know how to fear God is when we know the consequences of sin. We learn to fear Him, how scary and holy He is. Just because you are forgiven. God forgives you. He's so loving. He will forgive you. But you still go through consequences because He loves you so much and He wants you to learn so that you won't do that next time. I love you guys so much. I just want you to be more like Jesus. Only takes true repentance. You absolutely, without a shadow of doubt, need true repentance. Get a tape, get notes, steal the notes, don't steal the notes, borrow the notes. <laughs> Try to apply that in your life, deeper in your prayer life. Amen? Let's pray. There are different ways to love people. And when some people love somebody, some people give flowers. Some people give kiss. I scream when I love. Perhaps just dinky little glimpse of how much he loves you. And he wants you to come to him. He knows you're filled with mud. You played in the mud. You're dirty. He knows that. He knows outside, inside, you're filthy. But He still loves you. There's not a single thing you can do to get Him away for His love and kindness pursues after you. 
even through the gates of hell he will go through to find you for gates of hell will not prevail he loves you so much but when you come to him he wants you he wants to cleanse you he wants to wash your hand before you eat you need to repent that's the only way you can get closer to him death of repentance which would lead to true dedication of your life you are half-hearted because you do not know true repentance please pray and apply these principles that you learn in your life I feel so drained God has spoken to you take it in your heart and apply it in your lives as I am and let's all get closer to the Lord I just want you to be fantastic servants of Jesus Christ you heard I heard we are all brothers and sisters in Christ and you affect us my sin will affect you hey let's help one another by being closer to the Lord repenting doing our part okay just today just ask God saying Lord teach me how to repent teach me how to pray teach me how to truly repent my sin grant me only God can grant you repentance spirit of repentance yeah, just ask God please please grant me and teach me how to repent so that I may get closer to you I may dedicate my life to you okay? let's pray to the Lord for a few minutes shall we Lord, you love every one of these beloved saints of God. You love every one of us so much. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your son. Help us, teach us how to truly repent. Thank you for your example and word through your man of God, David. And help us to apply the principle of this kind of prayer in our lives so that we may become awesome, powerful Christians, transformed within our lives and commitment to you. Depth of the cross, power of the Savior, love of our God, so that we may be Christians that will flip this world upside down with the conviction and the power of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we rise and sing this prayer? And we will pray through this song as we sing it together. May David's prayer be our prayer within our hearts. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew our eyes, be within me create me a clean heart O oh God and renew our eyes spirit within me
confess me not away. Don't take the anointment of the Holy Spirit away from me. Thy presence, O oh Lord. Cast me not away from thy presence, O oh Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore. joy of thy salvation and renew our eyes spirit within cast me not away from that presence O oh Lord let's pray to the Lord cast me not away from thy presence O oh Lord Take not the Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew our eyes, Spirit, within. 